Hey, LinkedIn, and welcome back to Business Unusual, a live show where we are speaking with you about how the coronavirus is impacting the ways that we all work. I'm your host, Caroline Fairchild, Editor-at-Large at LinkedIn, coming to you from my home office here in New York City. What should you be doing with your money amid a global pandemic? It's a question that we see lots of you have right now on and off LinkedIn. And it's something that in a survey of workers that we did recently on LinkedIn was the primary concern that everyone has in terms of what they should be doing with their money. How should they be thinking about investing? And how can you really plan for the long term when things are changing so rapidly daily? When I knew that this was an issue that the LinkedIn community wanted to discuss, I knew I had to call up Sally Krawcheck. She is a longtime Wall Street executive and five years ago, about five years ago, launched her own digital investment platform, Elvest. And she is the person to ask questions to. So if you have questions for Sally, this is your time. I know there's a lot of questions about what to do about investing. If you have to file for unemployment, what about if you have to take a pay cut right now? Sally's the person to chat with this. She's been doing lots of webinars, both on and off LinkedIn on this very topic. But we want to hear from you. If you're joining the stream right now, let us know what your questions are, what your concerns. We'll have a conversation about that on today's show. And with that, I want to bring on Sally. Hey, Sally. Caroline. How so are you? you? How are you hanging in? I'm doing, you know, hanging in, hanging in. Yeah, <laughs> drinking a lot of coffee and I'm trying to um, make sure that I drink my weight in wine every night just to get through this. I am on the wine train as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us. As I said, we're seeing tons of LinkedIn members have questions about what to do with their finances right now. I want to start and zoom out a little bit. This is not your first rodeo, as they say. Does this compare to any of the recessions that we've experienced in the past? How is it different and what are you seeing? Yeah, look, you know, every economic downturn slash crisis is different and every single one is the same. Um, and the difference for this one is that it's happened in record time. We went from bull market to bear market in record time because the economy went from motoring forward to not just record unemployment, but by far record unemployment. We're seeing here today that we wiped out all the employment gains, you know, over the past 10 plus years. So that happened in record time. And it's also happening at a time when we're worried about our families, about our own health, you know, about, you know, not having been in such a dramatic decline before. What does the other side look like? Is it V-shaped? Is it U-shaped? Is it W-shaped? Is it swoosh-shaped? The economists really never know, but in particular don't know. Mm -hmm. The reason it's the same is because what we've seen in past downturns, which I sort of think of as this conversation between the markets and the policymakers, it, you know, is occurring. That the markets are being volatile and moving down and giving signals to the policymakers, hey, it's a recession. Hey, it's a really bad recession. Hey, we're in a depression. And without that back and forth, which is so painful, then the policymakers wouldn't have the signals and the clues they needed in order to respond. But just as the downturn has been record fast, the policy response has been record fast, which you know I think many of us might not have expected given the rancor that's in DC. So the only thing I'll say is, this had to happen this way. You, you know, I think you and I couldn't imagine that we would have the stimulus package we had if the markets hadn't gone so berserk. It's, it's sort of part of the necessary. And then the final thing I'll say, where I hope and believe it's the same, is that we have recovered from every single recession and depression in history. And we have recovered from every single bear market in history. We don't know when, but we know that we have always recovered. And I wouldn't bet against our recovering this time either. Right. I think that's a really great insight. And you mentioned the market fluctuation. I don't know about you, but you, know, you read all these headlines. Things are up. Things are down. Things are bad. Things are worse. For those on the stream who are wondering how to actually interpret that for what it means for their money right now, what would you say to them? Well, look, uh, you know, I hope um, that so many of the viewers are in a position where it just doesn't mean anything for the money that you are investing. You have an investing plan. You're investing money that's for the long term, so you don't have to access it right away. That, of course, may be quite different for people. There may, may be people who need to. But that I hope it's, hey, you know, it's invested and I, I'm, I've got my emergency fund. I've got my credit card, you know, all paid off so I can leave this over here and know 
that, you know, yeah, it feels like I should be doing something. I mean, how in the world can it be the world would change so dramatically? And I'm really still supposed to be investing a percent out of every paycheck. How can that feel like it's the right answer when in fact it is? When in fact it is that, you know, but the, mar the equity market historically, we think of it as doing this. It's done that. And I believe that in 10, 15, 20 years, this will be just a blip in an upward trend. And that those who continue to invest right now will say, you remember when we invested back in 2020? Boy, look at what happened there. That's what's happened historically. That's mm -hmm. what it's been historically. And so hopefully that's what it can be. Let me, there's one stat I just, sort of one uh, factoid I love to share when we think about, yeah, but really, really, you know, if we had invested, if we go, went back to 1900 um, and had been able to invest $1,000, but then I sat down with you and I said, you know, Caroline, a bunch of bad stuff's going to happen over the next, call it, we won't get to 2020, but 119 years. We're going to have the flu pandemic of 1917. It's going to be terrible. We're going to have World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the Great Recession. We're going to have stagflation, inflation, the Korean War, you know, the oil crisis. We're going to have the Viet Vietnam War. We're going to have the, you know, internet bubble that's going to burst. I mean, you're going to look at this and you're like, we're going to elect a movie star and a reality star. And you'd be like, wow, what a messed up country. That's horrible. And I'd say, what do you think? that thousand dollars would be worth. And you'd probably say, hey, I get it. It's a trick question. It's going to be worth more. And, you know, maybe if you didn't know what happened, you'd be like, well, I don't know, $10,000. Maybe if you sort of did, you'd be like, oh, it's a million dollars. You know, it's so that's going to be worth it. A thousand, two million. The answer is $57 million, $57 million. Right. And that's if you leave it in. And yeah, that stuff's happening. But the energy and the forward motion and the innovation of, American business people, the dynamism of capitalism, right, has pushed us further forward that even during all of that, people find ways to start successful businesses, you know, find way, ways to grow. And I don't see any particular reason that the next 119 or 20 years will be any different. And that's just the power of compounding. Right. So the message there really is, is that if you do have the ability to keep your money where it is right now, just let it sit there and probably don't check your 401k statements every day for now. For those who are just joining the stream, uh, this is Business Unusual, a uh, live show where we're talking about how the coronavirus is impacting the ways that we work. I want to say hello to Tara, Catherine, Richard, Adeline for joining us. I'm here with Sally Krawcheck personal finance guru who's talking to all of us about how we should be thinking about money right now. I'm already seeing the questions roll in from Siddharth, Arshel, uh, Malou. Thank you so much. We'll get to your questions later on in the show. In terms of how we should be thinking about investments and job security right now, uh, mm -hmm. Sally, a lot of people are timid that they're going to get laid off, that they yeah. don't know what's going to happen. How would you make that calculation in your head right now about if you're not sure how secure your job is right now, thinking about what to be doing, say, with emergency funding, fund saving, yeah. things like that? Yeah, look, it's a very valid worry. I mean, we are, you know, going to are at and are going to be at record unemployment. And the question is how quickly it comes back on the other side. So what I would say, regardless, even in a steady state, um, in order to be financially well, in order to set yourself up for a lifetime of being able to live the life you want to have the retirement you want to, you know, you want to get your credit card debt paid off. And that's true, whether it's, you know, two months from now when I hope things are much better or it's true today, the credit card debt, which can cost you 15%, 18%, 25%, whatever saps at your wealth. And, and frankly, Caroline, I'm always really surprised You'll talk to people who just have it together, just have it together. And they've got $10,000 worth of savings. Well, they got $15,000 worth of credit card debt. You're like, what the heck is that? So that you pay, you get paid off and you should prioritize getting that paid off. And if that means, you know, you have to cut expenses to do it, do it. On the other side of that, if that means that you can't buy something without taking on credit card debt, that means you can't buy something without taking on credit card debt and sort of recognizing what your financial means are in living within them. That's number one, get that credit card debt outstanding. Do not invest in the stock market. Do not pass go until you get that credit card debt outstanding. Mm -hmm. Number two, you want to be building an emergency fund. Nothing sexy about this. It's three to six months of take-home pay in a bank account, FDIC insured. 
not earning very much, if anything, and it is there in case of an emergency. And hey, now we know why, right? Mm -hmm. So three to six months, three months if you're younger, less complex life, six months, you're a little more mature, like, of course, not me, but other people I know who are more mature, um, and you have a family. Um, from then on, the next step you want to take is to be investing in your 401k. Now, I can get convinced to invest in the 401k with a match before you build the emergency fund, but we don't have to get complicated about it. Um, you get the tax deferral benefits. You might get a match, which is free money. And from there, you want to start investing in a diversified investment portfolio, stocks, bonds, et cetera. Mm -hmm. On a steady state, your take-home pay, 50% should go to needs, 30% should go to fun. And I cannot tell you, Caroline, how much fun I plan to have on the other side of this. 20% is to future you. And that 20% is where you pay off the credit card debt, build the emergency fund, invest in the 401k and a certain percent out of every paycheck. Some folks will say, I can't afford 20%. I'm new to the job or I have these obligations. I totally understand. Start with one, start with two. Now, how does that shift right now? Right now, it shifts that we're not having, you know, maybe 30% is too much for fun. You're not going out for dinner. You're not traveling. Let's put that into future you in the emergency fund. You know, maybe you're nervous about your job. Then let's take that and put it into the emergency fund. Keep some part to take care of yourself to, you know, just have that little splurge, order that little thing. But in general, shifting towards that future you, more savings, more emergency fund is a pretty prudent thing to do right now, regardless of what you're thinking. And, and look, you can also see with your business assigns, right? You know, is the business booming and they're hiring people because you work at Zoom, you know, or is the business sort of pulling back? You, you can see what's going on. Right. I like that calculation, the 50, 30, 20 there. I'm seeing a lot of questions in the stream right now, Sally, from members like Linda and Fred. They're asking that they're saying their stimulus checks are actually coming in and they want to know what they should use that money for. Do you have any advice for them in terms of if they just got that check in, where it should go? Yeah. And, and I again, I think it depends really on individual circumstances. And I would go right back to how are you set up? If you have credit card debt outstanding, use that money if you can to pay that off. You know, I, to I totally get it if you've lost your job and you don't have any money coming in, you need to keep the credit card. But assuming you're more steady state, pay off that credit card debt or save it if you can and build that emergency fund. But absolutely, if you need to spend it on your expenses, that is what it's for. Spend it, you know, in order to get yourself through that, through these. It's only if you're fortunate enough to still have the income, still have the capabilities that you do that credit card, emergency fund, 401k mm -hmm. investing sort of, you know, right. build. And, and speaking of income, one of the issues that we're seeing a lot on LinkedIn, particularly in industries like design, media, retail right now, workers are being asked to take a pay cut right now. So yeah. they've been making a steady stream of income and now that is less. And for them, what should they be thinking about in terms of how they should recalculate their finances right now? Yeah, look, I, you know, I hate to say it, but those are the folks who, you know, with so many people losing their jobs, it's sort of hard to complain if your company says, hey, we're trying to protect these jobs and therefore we're going to be taking down compensation either forever or for some period of time. Um, and I know that's hard to sort of count yourself as, OK, you know, it, it could have been worse. Um, this is a time to take a step back and look at expenses. I mean, really look at expenses and say, are there places where you know, I can, I've been spending and I can just cut back. I mean, I, I don't know about you, Caroline, but I'm, I get these subscriptions and I'm like, what the heck was this app that I, you know, right. I don't even know what like you, it was. Yeah, I've, I've been seeing that those come in and I've been checking them closer since we've all, we're all been home. And I, I have no idea what this $10 charge is. Or this $20 exactly. is dollars make or break. Maybe not, but 10 plus 10 plus 10. If you sit there and you go, what are my subscriptions? What are the things I've been buying? What do you know? And then take an afternoon. Um, hey, we've got nothing but time. Call your utility company, call your cell phone company, you know, call anybody where you're spending money and say, look, I'm thinking about, you know, the cable company, et cetera. Call anybody and say, will you take down what you're charging me? Now, on the student loan side, we've got this moratorium on um, interest and payments until the end of September. But, you know, it doesn't hurt to call and say, look, I've been making these payments on time for forever. You know, how about take down my rate? You'd be surprised. The worst thing they can say is no, and you wasted 15 minutes. Look at your credit card debt. 
it, you know, take it from paying that, if you can't afford to pay it off, take it from paying that 18% or so, put it on a 0% um, percent balance transfer, take the money you save and use it to pay down the principal um, or call the credit card company and, and see if they'll take it down. The worst thing people can say is no, but taking a look at these expenses. And again, there's sort of natural savings right now. The dinner's out, you know, the travel, you know, the subway fare take all of that and get that to shore up your financial strength. And it, it you know, again, it, any one thing here is probably not going to be the big deal, but some aggregation of it, um, cutting your expenses by 2%, 5%, 10%, 20%, we've heard people come up with can make the difference. Well, uh, Sally, I wanted to share that William is in the stream right now. He said he's using his stimulus to pay credit card debt. I think that is a Sally approved answer to what to do with that check. So I'll give you four thumbs up there, William. And if you're just joining the stream, this is Business Unusual, a show where we're talking about the coronavirus. Right now, we're talking about personal finance with LinkedIn influencer Sally Krawcheck. I'm seeing tons of questions in the stream, Sally. So I'm going to start to get through some of them, hopefully. Uh, Archel wants to know, is this a good time to invest in a Home. Obviously, we don't know your personal situation right now, Rachel, but I do know Sally has some thoughts about home buying amid a pandemic. Yeah, look, um, again, it matter. You know, personal circumstances matter. If you feel like your job is stable, if you are living within your means, um, if your you know, the amount of money you're taking in is more than the amount of money that you're spending, um, it could be a very good time. Let me tell you what it's not. It's not a good time to buy thinking prices are low and I'm going to flip, right? That's not, it's a good, it's always a good time for, I want a place for myself and my family and that I love and that I can cook in and that I can raise my little kitten into a cat in. It's always a good time for that. Now, as it happens, real estate historically um, has been upward trending in terms of the value, about 3% a year on average, more in some parts of the country, less in other parts of the country with some volatility. I will tell you as an investment, it's not the first investment I would tell you to make because as an investment only, ah, goes up about 3% a year, sometimes a lot more, sometimes a lot less. You really, most folks have to have leverage, i.e. a mortgage in order to buy a home. That means those swings are increased, which can be good, or as we saw in the real estate crisis of 10, 12 years ago, can be bad, versus if I were to compare that investment with an investment in equities that historically, even with this downturn since the 1920s, have gone up 9.5, 9.70% a year, where you don't have to employ leverage, I, you don't take a mortgage to buy equities, where they're very liquid. Sometimes you try to sell a house, it takes a long time. Equities, for better or for worse, five days a week, stock exchange are open, you can get in and out, maybe not the price you want. You would go for equities all the time versus real estate. Yeah. But if you say, hey, I'm in pretty good shape, maybe I'll get a little bit of a deal because of the coronavirus. I'm totally okay with buying real estate now. Just don't you know, think you're smart enough to figure out the real estate cycles and you're going to make some killing. Right. So maybe not the first investment, but if your situation is in a way where you could make that investment right now, not the worst thing that you could do. Yeah, not the worst All right. Thing. Seeing some lots of questions in the stream from Denise Douglas J asking about 401k advice. Denise is in her late fifties and she's wondering what she should be doing with that money. Um, Douglas says, if you still have a paycheck, should you be maxing out your 401k right now? Uh, how should they be thinking about that? Yeah. So Denise being a young woman in her late fifties, so a lot, a lot of time, you know, um, you, you know, I'm hoping that going into this, you had a plan. Um, and I'm hoping that you can continue to execute on the plan. And that plan should involve about 20% of your take-home pay, as we mentioned earlier, going to future you. Um, and that can be 10% going into a 401k. That could be maybe 5% going into an investment account, maybe 5%, you know, if you haven't paid off, you know, before, if you haven't paid off the credit card debt, but in average, now it can be 20% can be less. I can't afford it right now. I'm sending the kids to college or I'm starting out in my career. But in general, that 50, 30, 20 rule, 50% to needs, 30% to fund, 20% to future you, maybe of a 10% into the 401k. In addition, I hope, and you should keep doing that. 
Um, in addition, I hope you have a plan in which for your 401k, if you're younger, you've had more inequities. And if you're more mature, you've had less inequities. Why? Because if you're younger, you have time to weather the ups and downs of which we're seeing now in order to earn the higher returns that historically have been available from investing equities. If you're older, you don't want to be as much in equities, even though it can have a higher return, because what if like oh, the day before you want to retire, this thing happens, right? There's an old rule of thumb. It's not exact. It's not great. But just as a, a sort of rule of thumb for thinking about it, you know, your investment portfolio historically should have been 100 minus your age as the percent of equities. So if you are 30 years old, 100 minus 30, you should be 70 percent in equities, 30 percent in debt. If you are 60 years old, 100 minus 60, 40 percent equities, 60 percent debt. Sort of a rule of thumb just to squint at it and say, is that that right or not? Mm -hmm. There is no reason if that plan is in place for you today to say, you know what, I'm not going to invest in the 401k anymore. Um, and in fact, my, I would put forth to you any decision like that that you make is likely wrong. What? You know, you mean, it's, what if I buy, you know, should I be buying more or selling more? I mean, you're essentially making a trading decision. Mm -hmm. And the chances of you who are probably thinking about this for maybe at the most an hour, you probably turned on CNBC, you watched a few shows, you're like, boy, people seem sort of freaked out or something. The chances of you getting that decision right and earning incremental returns when in fact, essentially by making that decision, you are making a bet that the market is wrong, that whatever the stock market is discounting today as is sort of captured in the price, that the stock market is wrong, the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of individual and professional portfolio managers and traders who are making decisions are somehow wrong and you have an insight as to the mispricing that will cause you to either buy or sell. The chances of that are in fact close to zero. And so what you want to do is have a plan and execute on the, you know, have a well thought out plan and execute on it. And, and by the way, if you need to shift it, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm 70 years old and I'm investing in only Bitcoin. Yes, pull that back, right? right? Change your plan, but don't change a, a solid plan because you, you have a hunch. Right. We are seeing tons of questions in the stream asking about specific stocks to buy right now. And if you should be investing in crypto, I don't know if you have any insight yeah. into that. I mean, oh, God, don't even get me started on the crypto thing. You know, look, in investing already. Right. You know, it's full of risk and all, you know, all that stuff. But crypto actually has no fundamental underpinning. And so the only bet you are making on crypto these days is so, some group of people if you're buying, will decide they value it more than you do at some point in time. Like, why would you make that bet with your money? Absolutely not. When you invest in equities, there is an underlying earnings stream and dividends. And sure, people in the future, you know, or, well, I'm not, I don't think the dividend is going to hold up or, I, you know, I don't, I don't think the business is going to deteriorate, but there's an un, there are underlying fundamentals. Okay. Mm -hmm. But again, let me, I can't make this point strongly enough. You know, if you are going to be trading through this, the overwhelming likelihood is you will lose. You will lose because you are making a bet against professional investors that you see something. You might win. Could be, you know, just by chance. Right. Everybody's talking at cocktail parties about, oh, I bought such and such and such and such mm -hmm. a year. Hey, it worked out for him. Mm -hmm. what, you know, if you want to do that because the casinos in Las Vegas are not open, go for it. But please don't do it with your retirement money and with your financial well-being. Just do that as a favor for me. I think that's some practical advice. And I have some more practical questions now coming into the stream. One from Emma who wants to know, what are your thoughts on paying off more student loan debt right now? Well, there's no interest. So all of your payments would be principal is what she's asking. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, look, so first of all, I'd say pull, pull back for a second. Um, for all debt, you want to pay off as rapidly as you can any debt that costs you more than 7% a year. So when we've been talking, Caroline, we've really been talking about credit card debt. And, and that's been an example because it's so it can be so expensive. But I would say anything above 7%. Why above 7%? Because the other uses of that money, you're not going to earn more than 7% on any consistent basis. The diversified investment portfolio is not going to earn you there. We tend to say anything below 4% at Elevest 
you leave that outstanding. I mean, obviously pay it on time, but leave it outstanding because you can, you, you know, historically have earned quite a bit more by investing, you know, that money in a different place. And between four and 7%, it's sort of your choice. You know, for some people, they're like, yeah, I'm okay having it outstanding. I'm paying on time. I'm fine. For other people, they say just driving me berserk. I can't stand to owe money. So that can be a personal circumstance. And so I would use that as a lens right now for should I pay off more, get the principal down? You know, I would use that as a guide. It depends on what the weight is on it. depends on how crazy it's driving you. But certainly if you can afford to um, you're and you're able to, then yeah, go for it. Right. And we are seeing a lot of questions in the stream right now, too, about transitioning jobs during this time. Hiring mm -hmm. is obviously down, but people are making moves. Steven, for example, says he's asking you if you recommend him transitioning to a new job, if it's a promotion or if he should stay put, given, I mean, how crazy would it be? My husband's doing this actually right now, changing jobs in the global pandemic. Is it worth that right now? Well, it, it, how much do you love or hate your existing job? You know, look, if you are miserable in what you're doing and God, goodness knows I've had points in my career where I have been, then just go, right? You know, worst thing happens, you're still miserable and you're, you're finding a different place. That being said, if you, you know, have a company you love, you're motoring ahead, um, the company is benefiting from, you know, this downturn or doing well, you might want to give it a second thought before you head off to someplace new for not that much more money. You know, you know, there, there can be sort of a devil, you know, versus a devil you don't. I would say the one there, there aren't many silver linings here. And I do want to acknowledge that. And I know a lot of people are being laid off and I know it's a very stressful, stressful time. Um, I will tell you that my biggest career accelerations have occurred after I've taken career breaks is what therefore when I've had the time to think deeply about what I was good at, what I'm not good at, what I love, what motivates me and what I want to accomplish in this world. And so, you know, I went to, I thought I was so smart, you know, during the, um, the uh, recession of the early nineties, that's when I went to business school. And my thinking was, you know, I'll, I'll ride out the recession at business school. It wasn't as expensive then as it is today. I'll learn a lot and I'll come out and hit the, the uptrend. It didn't quite work out that way. I came out and the uptrend wasn't in place and I was in one job and then left it within a year. But it was at that period of time when I took off about nine months that I actually deeply thought about what I wanted and made a transition from investment banking to um, sell-side equity research, which was the single smartest decision of my life. And my career went from this to just vertical. I was, I think I, I don't want to brag because women aren't supposed to brag, but I think I, I was the number you one. Ranked analyst. Okay. I'm going for it. I was the number one ranked analyst less than a year after stepping into new responsibilities in the, in the industry. And that, that is what they call product market fit. Right. Or maybe talent job fit. And it's, you know, if I hadn't had the career break, I never would have made the change because I would have been too busy doing my job. And I think that that's a perspective that a lot of people want to need to hear right now, honestly, because I think a lot of people are kind of feeling stuck or feeling like they don't yeah. know what to do at this time. But it could be that this career break or or what you're, the time you have extra right now to say learn a new skill. We're seeing an uptick, I think, of 28% of people on LinkedIn learning right now. So it's a good time to reset and rethink. I'm seeing some people in the stream. Kathy said the layoff, she got laid off recently. It was a blessing. She's looking forward to her next mm -hmm. job. Others are agreeing with you that this is a jump starting their search. I'm seeing tons of questions. I'm hoping that Sally doesn't have a hard stop at 12:30. If she does, she can tell. Me. All right. Yeah, okay. I've seen some of my family. I'm totally fine to continue. <laughs> seen enough great. of my husband for like the rest of. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to tell my husband that lunch is going to be a little bit late. But there's so many questions. Okay, so this one. You know, one thing I would, you know, one thing I would interject with that, you know, you got to compartmentalize here. And, and I know maybe that, you know, if you had a psychologist on, maybe they would say that wasn't healthy, but I'm a business person. And so what I'm, you know, what I would suggest you try to do is give yourself the time and the space to be nervous and uncertain and scared and look at the news obsessively that you know you're not supposed to, you know, 
do all that stuff. Give yourself an hour a day. I'm just going to like freak, you know, some period of the day I'm going to spend advancing a skill. You know, I'm going to take, whether it's LinkedIn learning or someplace else, I'm going to learn about marketing analytics. I'm going to learn how to code, right? I'm going to learn about leadership and so much online is being made available. And then I'm also going to give myself time to deep think. And that was sort of the key for me when I made those career transitions. And the times that I would do it, Caroline, were first thing in the morning and in the evening. And in the morning, I would journal and what do I like to do and what's important to me? And if I'm on my deathbed, what do I want to be look back on? And I would do the same thing over a glass of wine. And I know these are both research based. Believe it, I, I found it intuitively. But that, you know, at these points in time, when you're half asleep and when you're half had a half a glass of wine, you know, sort of your defenses come down, your subconscious begins to speak to you. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, what I would say for me when I went through this, it didn't happen fast. It wasn't like, you know, I put in a solid three days and I have decided to make a career switch. It, I had to do some excavation, but I would say, you know, investing that in yourself. I mean, look, we all got time now. Right. And making that investment in getting to know yourself is, I think, going to be the smartest investment you can possibly make. We do all have time now, but I wouldn't be me and you wouldn't be you if I didn't ask you this question, which is how is the downturn impacting women versus men? We have all these women now working from home, having to do homeschooling. You know, equal payday this month came and went. How is this going to impact gender parity? I mean, what are what are you seeing in terms of gender differences with this downturn and how it's impacting women specifically? I did not think that's where you were going. You know where I think you know where I thought we'll you were get going. there. We're gonna get there. Yeah. Don't worry. So, so everybody, she's she, you know, it, just to prove that you know, bipartisanship can happen. She's Duke, I'm UNC, but we still actually like each other. I, I was going to say, look, you know, the truth is you, you can't miss the tournament if they didn't have a tournament. That's this what I'm saying. This is a true story. That. I did have to tell Sally when I first reached out, there used to be a Duke basketball in my home office. And I told Sally, I will remove the Duke basketball if you come on the show. And she agreed. So. There we go. There we go. So, so about the gender issue, Carolyn, which I think is an important issue. I don't know the answer to it yet. Um, we are seeing articles early on that women are up oh, here we go here's the phone um that women are losing their jobs at a disproportionate rate um and if we back up you know what is also important to know is that you know it's it's funny i don't really quite understand why we talk about the gender pay gap so much the 82 cents that women make to a man's dollar which is ever so slowly moving in the right direction, not fast enough, but ever so slowly. I don't know why we don't talk about the gender wealth gap more often. The gender wealth gap is 32 cents to a man's dollar, and it's been moving in the wrong direction. And the difference between these two, you know, is how much women invest, how much debt we have outstanding, the rates we pay on it, et cetera, et cetera. So things we're really working to um, you know, make better at Elevest. So women have gone into this with a greater incidence of poverty, less wealth, and are losing their jobs at a greater degree. So that's a just a bad set of circumstances. And I think if we look historically, those who have been less well off in tough times, you know, do worse in tough times. If we heart, if I'm going to continue to be um, downbeat. Um, if we hark back to the financial crisis of 07, 08, um, when we came out of that, diversity went backwards. Diversity, certainly in financial services, my industry went backwards. The slight glimmer of hope is that women who do have means, who are invested, tend to come out of these things better because they don't trade their portfolio as much. They just let it sit. And so they experience the recovery better. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going to, I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant for a second. Like if this doesn't help us drive diversity, I just don't know what else is going to. Because, you know, when I, typically you and I've had this conversation, you know, you, you tell me anybody who thinks the financial crisis would have been worse if we'd had more women in senior roles, if we'd had more women traders, if we'd had more women portfolio managers, like nobody thinks it would have been worse, right? It would have been better. The diversity would have made it better. Who thinks the pandemic would have been worse if more moms were in charge, right? Nobody. 
we would have been sent to our rooms in January, right? With cocoa and a warm blanket. And, you know, there's, re there, you know, there are articles and now I'm starting to talk about the countries that have done best are those who are run by women. I haven't fact checked it and gone through every piece of research, but I know if my mom were queen of the world, you know, yeah, we would be in a different set of this different set of circumstances. My mom, who I'm sure is tuning in right now, would agree that if she were in charge, things would be definitely a little different. Look, the diversity thing, we've both been tracking that. I really hope that this time it doesn't go reverse. I am speaking to lots of thought leaders who are saying this is the time where they're investing actually more in their diversity practices as they're thinking about bringing in new talent. So I'm holding on to that glimmer of hope as well, Sally. Uh, I want to share some comments in the stream before I let you go. Odessa says, please brag more, LOL. Donna says, brag bites are perfectly fine. So we have some support here on the stream for us talking openly about our career success. Fabian says, thank you for your insight. Sally, this has been extraordinarily helpful. Giuseppe says, thank you so much. Great insight. Use this time to rediscover yourself and understand where you want to be. So Sally, I know I speak for the LinkedIn community when I say thank you so much for joining us. If we didn't get to your questions, Sally covered a lot in the course of the last 37 minutes. So rewatch the show, share with friends. And Sally, it was great to see you and go Duke. Yeah, so no, go heels. One plug, Caroline, um, for what we're doing at LFS during this period of time. We didn't get to your questions. Ship them over to us. Send us an email at questions at LFS.com. Our commitment to our community during this is we're going to answer every single money question you've got. And so that is, they, of course, they're investing questions, they're financial planning questions, but we've also got our executive coaches as well. Um, and I know it's just like a, a really confusing time. Things are moving quickly. So we'll answer the question personally, and then we're you know, taking all of them, anonymizing them and posting them so you can see the questions that other people are asking um, over there. So and we'll just keep doing more LinkedIn lives. Um, right. And, well. and when the stream wraps, I'm going to update the post with a link to Sally's profile. You can follow her there. She's sharing insights daily. So she's a great follow right now, both on and off the platform. Sally, again, thanks so much for joining us. Go Heels. <laughs> that was Sally Krawcheck the co-founder of LMS and the CEO talking to us about personal finance right now amid COVID-19. I want to thank everyone for joining us on the stream. Uh, Luke, Mahul, Siddharth, Emily, Sharon, Asad, Kadir, thank you for your questions. Uh, this is such an impactful conversation for me. We covered everything from what to think about in terms of a job search right now to how to think about your 401k. So if you're just joining us, you can rewatch the stream as soon as we wrap. I'm Caroline Fairchild. This is Business Unusual. We're coming to you live from the LinkedIn editor's page every day, weekday at noon. So join us. We're covering a lot of things to do with the coronavirus. My colleague, Susie Jackson, will be back with you tomorrow at noon. So please join then. Thanks so much.